Hello, Berlin. How is everyone? It's an absolute pleasure to be here on this stage. As Sarah said, I've been coming to JSConf for years, and I'm so privileged and pleasured to be back on this stage and to give back to the community. Very sad that I'm not here with my family, because to me, also, coming back to JSConf every time feels like coming back to see my family. And I think that's because of the amazing community uh, we have built here and the organizers built. So can I also get a massive round of applause for the organizers for allowing us all to be here to do this? <clears throat> So my name is Patrick Hammond. You can catch me on the, on the Twitters and on the, across the internet at, at Patrick Hammond. And I work for the edge cloud provider Fastly, um, where we specialize in real-time content delivery for the world's leading brands. And there I get a lot of time to sit and think about and research how we can make our customers' websites load as fast as possible. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So why am I actually here? And what does the clickbaity BuzzFeed head headline of to push or not to push even means? I'm not, certainly not going to recite uh, Hamlet uh, to you now. And the reason I'm here is because of this. I hear this all the time. In fact, I've sat on stages like this and said exactly this, that HTTP2 is going to solve this problem. It's going to solve problem X or Y. Literally everyone. And, and we, the problem is, is it's not. Resource loading in the browser is very, very hard. And hopefully after this talk, you have a better understanding of why it's hard, but some of the techniques that we have in our toolbox today to overcome some of the problems that is introduced. And why is it hard? It's because performance is tightly coupled to latency. The speed of light is not going to get any faster. Connection costs are high. TCP handshake and round trip times aren't going to go away. TCP's congestion control algorithm is there for very, very good reasons, but it penalizes us at the beginning of a connection when it's most important. Our critical resources can be hidden to the browsers. Browsers are extremely powerful things and have speculative passes, but they simply are not magic enough to know the resources that you as an application developer want to load. And because of that, bandwidth is often underutilized. We leave idle connections open where we could be sending resources, but we just simply can't do that yet because of the way that browsers and servers interact with each other. And finally, once we do get it down, script, especially for the reasons why a lot of us are here as JavaScript developers, is extremely expensive to parse and execute, and we waste idle time on the network again because of that. And so how can we load our resources most efficiently? And what patterns and techniques can we use today and what's coming up in the future that's going to enable us to do this in the most efficient and speedy way? So first, I want us to do a thought exercise. Think about the product or the website that you're designing today. And if you were only allowed to send three resources down the wire, what would they be? Is it your font? Is it the lazy loaded related comments at the back on the bottom of this ft.com homepage or the adverts? No, I don't think so. What did the user actually come here for? And that's what you need to be thinking about. Ben Schwartz, my dear friend from Calibre, who's actually sitting here with us today, he, he equates this that we talk, a lot of the time when we're talking about loading, we talk about the critical request path or a critical request. And he defines a critical request as one that contains an asset that is essential to the content within the user's viewport. And so what are your critical resources? Have that exercise. I want you really to take this away from my talk, because I want you to think about what are the two or three things that you need to send down as soon as possible so that the browser can get on with rendering and creating a good user experience for your users. Is it the critical CSS for your initial route? Is it your fonts, your hero images? One thing that we don't discuss enough is that application bootstrap data. A lot of server-side, single, sorry, client-side rendered applications probably make a JSON request that's hidden to the browser. It's known as a hidden sub-resource, and the browser doesn't know about it up front. We need to be able to tell the browser what the resource is specifically to our need and for, to create delightful users' experiences. And so once you've determined what your, um, your critical requests are, you need to think about how they contribute to the user's experience. After all, performance is a user experience problem. What resources do you need to get a first meaningful paint? What resources do you have to deliver so that users can start interacting with your website as fast as possible? And it's this section here that we're going to focus on today, this initial loading experience, and how we can tell the browser, give it, make the, uh, allow the browser to make informed decisions about what it loads so that we can have delightful user's experience. So I summarize a good loading strategy as one that prioritizes above the fold rendering, prioritizes interactivity. It's easy to use, because some of them that we're going to look at today aren't necessarily. And most importantly, it's measurable. The first 
uh, solution to overcoming a performance problem is to measure your current um, performance and then optimize for it. So the first technique that we've done, now that we've identified what we should be loading, let's see how we can do this efficiently. And the first technique I'm going to discuss is the preload API. What if we could tell the browser ahead of time what the critical resources are required for this? And now the problem is, earlier on, we identified fonts and application bootstrap data as being critical resources. However, they're hidden from the browser. And why is this? First, you make a get request for the home page. We wait for the response for that. HTML is an amazing specification. It can be parsed incrementally. So as the bytes come down the wire, the browser can start constructing the DOM without having to wait for the whole HTML file to be delivered. Once it does that, browsers have this amazing thing called speculative parses or pre-parses that it goes ahead whilst it's constructing the DOM and finds all of your style sheets or your script tabs referenced in the page and then actually initiates fetches for them ahead of time. But with CSS, unfortunately, it's, it's render blocking, and it can't be parsed incrementally. We have to wait for all of the bytes to come down first, because if we didn't, we'd like, cause lots of painting flashing on the screen because due to the way the cascade works. And so eventually, it's only until this point that the CSS object model and the document object model are combined to form what's known as the render tree. And it's only at this point, when we have a render tree and we've done all of this networking first, is when the browser will dispatch the font request. Because your CSS may reference five or six font files, but actually only two of them are being used for that initial load. And this is why fonts are known as critical hidden sub-resources. The browser can't know about them up front. So the idea behind preload was what if we could provide a declarative fetch primitive that initiates an early fetch and separates fetching from resource execution, decoupling that logic, saying to the browser, I know you're going to find the font later on, and I know you need it. Or for your JavaScript application, I know I'm going to make a request for a JSON a file about the user. You're not going to find it till much later in the process, but I know about it. Here, go and perform the networking for it now. And that's why it's extremely powerful. And here, we now have three new primitives, one via HTML, um, one via JavaScript, and the other, my preferred method, via HTTP link headers. We also now, very, very recently, also have the module preload specification. For those of you that are shipping native modules in the browsers already, you can do that. Fonts have to be requested uh, as cross-origin because they are non-credentialed resources. So this is really powerful. Just by adding three HTTP headers, we can tell the browser up front about all of our critical resources. So if we were to look at the network waterfall for ft.com, for instance, before applying this, you'll see that the font files are really low priority here and because they haven't been discovered until the CSS file has been parsed. But just by adding the preload headers, we can instantly prioritize and initiate those fetches early and so, so the browser can get on with it. Fastly customer Shopify, Shopify sorry, um, saw that they have 50%, 1.2 seconds improvement on their time to text paint just by adding preload headers for their font files and their critical hidden sub-resources. I've been in the performance industry for a very long time, and I've never known a single technique that's one line of code that can have a two-second average improvement on, on the user experience of loading that page. But the question that I want to ask and propose to you is, is indicating resource hints via the HTML like this, in fact, too late in the connection flow, too late in the loading experience of the page? And that's what HTTP2 server push comes in, or specifically was designed to solve. And so let's look at how it can help us. First, let's look at the traditional request flow that you make when you're loading a page. You perform a GET request to your server, the server then has some server think time. It has to go and perform a database action or render some templates. All of the time, this is thinking. And then eventually, it will respond with your index.html, especially if you've got a server rendered application like this. Then the browser starts parsing it. It finds the CSS file. But this makes me quite sad, because we've left the connection open for so long whilst the, browser would, the server was doing that think time. At Fastly, we see an average server think time for between 200 and 400 milliseconds that we've wasted on the wire here. And round trip time could be anything between 800 to 1,000 milliseconds on a good 3G connection. So what if the server could predict the next thing that the, server, the, the client is going to request is that main.css file? And it could flush all the bytes for it down as soon as it receives that GET request. 
And you're probably wondering, how can I use Push? If you have a HTTP2 server enabled today, most of them are. Apache, Nginx, IIS, Node natively supports it. We can do this. We've in the industry, we've converged upon using our dear friend, the link preload header, to use as the semantic of, I want to push this resource. So if your server is H2 enabled, all it will do is read these, and it will initiate pushes for you. Really super quick win. If you don't want push and uh, you still want the semantics of preload, you can add the no push attribute there. And at Fastly, we also realized that you probably might want to only push and not have a race condition between push and preload. And so we allow you to say that, and we'll strip the header on the way out. But what benefit does this actually give us? If we were to look to our, our common waterfall for loading a page, we've got the index file. Then we look for the CSS, we find that. Then we perform the, app, the networking for the JavaScript and the CSS. By pushing the resource, we're saving one round trip here, the light shaded bit. The round trip time is the time it takes for the client to send the request to, and to hit the server and back again until we start receiving the first bytes. And again, on a 3G connection in Europe, that round trip turn could be a, as, as about 800 milliseconds. In some other developing areas, that could be seconds. And so it's great. It gives us a one round trip time saving to, to, to improve our loading experience. But notice here, this idle time is still left on the connection. And this makes me really, really sad. Why is this? Let's, let's look again at this request flow. As a server push is indicated via the link header, we have to wait for the server to do its think time and responding before we as a server, your proxy layer, your CDN, or if you use something like Apache or Nginx to balance between your application layer, it's only until we've received all of the HTML bytes we, we initiate that push. And that's far too late in the connection flow because we've still got that idle connection time. And this makes me really sad. But wasn't this what, the, what push was designed to solve? So to, to summarize, push gives us a run round trip saving, use of server long think times. But my, I would argue the fact that if you need, you have got that long server think time, you should be optimizing your servers instead. But is link header indication far too late in the connection flow? And this is where async push, or at least at Fastly we call it async push, comes in. And to be able to truly utilize push, we need to decouple the pushing behavior from our application's HTML response um, and, and do it right at the beginning of the connection flow. So a more common architecture, as I discussed, that you may have a CDN or a proxy sitting in front of your application server. As it receives that request, is that only there and then, whilst we have that server think time, we can push all of the bytes down the wire. And I forgot to mention earlier on, the way that push actually works is HTTP2 has a binary data framing layer. And this is, this is a magical thing that it allows us to, no longer is it just plain text on the wire on our TCP connection. Now we have binary frames, but that allows us to interleave separate data frames for subsequent requests or multiple requests at the same time, which is called multiplexing. This is why we can have a single HTTP2 connection open and deliver hundreds of resources at the same time. And so push works by sending a push promise frame, as you can see here. And this is a data frame sent down the wire to the client saying, I promise I'm going to send you these bytes. And here they are. Go and have them. And so utilizing the idle connection time like this makes me extremely happy. And again, you're probably wondering how you can do this. So this is just using Node's standard HTTP2 uh, standard library. I've got a request handler here. I check to see if it's, the URL matches. If it does, I'm like, OK, I want to initiate a push. And here is when you can flush down your critical resources that you've identified, piping them down a stream. And then you can go and perform your database lookups and your expensive server think time. And so let's see the benefits that this has on our waterfall. As you can see here, in our push example, yes, we had the one round trip saving when we were using the link header. By using async push, we've hit that holy grail that we're pushing all of the styles or JavaScript required to render the screen before the HTML is even consumed. So now we have, the browser has all of the information it needs to instantly render as soon as the HTML is finished. And that makes Patrick extremely happy. But what about the repeat view, I hear you asking? I mean, I definitely ask this a lot. We've already sent the assets to the client. And surely, if you're applying good cache control directives, that the, the, the client should have that asset in, in its cache. But the problem is, is that we've got no way of indicating to the server what is in its cache. So what actually is going to happen is that on the repeat view, we still push. 
and actually we've been detrimental here. And we could potentially create contention on the underlying network link and end up being worse than when you didn't push at all. And at Fastly, in fact, we've definitely been seeing this, and my peers at Google have also said that m the majority of the time we're actually seeing push to be caused as a regression as a performance technique instead of an improvement. One solution to this is um, the Polymer team at Google came up with the purple pattern. And you can only use this if you have a progressive web application and a service worker. You push all of your critical resources the first time the page is loaded, and then you cache them in a service worker and lazy load the rest. And so the subsequent request, the request never even goes out to the network, and then they can, so we, we don't have to push. So we benefit from not having um, <coughs> uh, to, to worry about the cache state. But that's only if you have a service worker, and a lot of us in the room may not have. And so the server's got no knowledge of the class state, and this is a really, really big problem. So what is the problem, right? The theory there is great. Push should be amazing. It should, we should be able to give the client all of the information it needs before um, I've even received the HTML. But the adoption is extremely low. And why is that? What's the problem? In fact, I, I also want to make a po poll here. Who is using H2 in production right now? And put, leave your hands up if you're also using push. Yeah, so only about 10% of the people that were using push, and there was only probably about 20% of the room that were using H2 at all. So what is the problem? Why is no one adopting it? To do that, let's take a look at the request flow again. Once we've sent the get request and we start pushing the bytes down the wire, I lied to you earlier on. It's, even though the, the browser doesn't um, have a mechanism for telling its cache state, it has a mechanism to reset that stream. And so you can send a reset stream frame saying, I don't want those bytes anymore for that. I've already got it in my cache. So that should solve the problem. But unfortunately, we've actually got a race condition here, that by the time the client has initiated the reset stream, but by the time that gets to the server, because our critical resources are normally quite small, we've actually flushed all of the bytes down the wire already. Or if, more importantly, they've probably left the user space of your server application that's inside their TCP buffer. And once something's in the kernel's TCP space, there's no way for an application to uh, prevent those bytes from being flushed down onto the physical link. So we've, we've got a, um, a, a race condition here, which really isn't a good thing. The new quick protocol that was developed by Google and is now going through ITF standardization is going to hopefully solve a lot of those problems by, you, by moving a lot of the application layer out of the kernel and into user space. And that's going to allow us to do some amazing things here. Another really common area of misconception or misuse of HTTP2 server push is how the servers actually cache that resource. And once I pushed all the bytes down, a still a request that's initiated from your page needs to claim that resource from the HTTP2's push cache. And a push cache um, is not connected to the HTTP cache. It's connected to the lifetime of that single HTTP2 connection. So for every H2 connection you have to an origin, you're also going to have a dedicated push cache for that. But one of the problems is the push cache is actually the last cache to be requested. As a request leaves the page, first it will go to the memory cache that's attached to that document. It's a, all of the resources that that document has already requested. Then it will be look, looked up in the service worker cache. Then the HTTP cache, the service worker cache, and the HTTP cache are shared globally, whereas the memory cache and the push cache aren't. And finally, it will, it will try and look inside the push cache. And so it's highly likely that a lot of the time, the push cache will never be claimed. And therefore, you've actually wasted sending bytes down the wire and created a detrimental experience and contention on the network. The other tricky thing here to note is HTTP2 connections are credentialed or non-credentials. And that's why a font file, as we've discussed before, has to be served as, an, as a non-credentials resource. So if a CSS file was to push a font file, the CSS file is credentialed, and so it actually won't be uh, able to claim the font file request. And so to summarize, the problem here is the push cache semantics is that the connection has to be authoritative for it, is a single cache per connection. The items can only be claimed once. So if you have multiple tabs open for the single one, then you can, the push can only be sent once, and you have to repeat that push. And the thing that I find that the most interesting is that it's not spec. The cache behavior is not spec as part of the specification. And so all of the browser's implementations vary wildly. And so if you do consider using HTTP2 push, I urge you to read this blog post by Jake Archibald, where he goes into great detail about all of the browser inconsistencies. And in fact, it is actually a lot tougher than we thought it was. 
Um, and if you don't, just a TLDR summarization of that, we can only really stably use push at the moment in Chrome and Firefox. Safari is completely non-deterministic in how it's pushing works because the HP2 networking stack is separate from Safari itself. It's, it just inherits it from OS X. And Edge have done some really great work. One of the good things that Jake did in this post was to go and document all the problems and create tickets on all of the browser's bug trackers. So I, my hat's off to Jake for doing that. Edge are really improving. Um, but not, not yet. There's still one connection per tag and no fetch support. So this leaves us to having to UA sniff for push. And I think that's really, really bad. And we all know what happens when we start going down that route, route of UA sniffing. And then lastly, the rate of adoption. I just got you all to put up your hands. For instance, at Fastly, we only see 0 0.008 requests. So that's 800 requests out of a million requests to do. We do around 6 million requests a second that we see as a push initiated. If push was so good, everyone should be using it, but they're not. And this lack of adoption has got so bad that certain vendors have considered even ripping push out of the HP2 specification entirely. So the question is, when should you push? Only if you have long round trip times, only if you have an app shell architecture and you could use the purple pattern, or for instance, if you could manage your own cache state natively, so if you've got a native application or an Electron app. So the question really is, is that one round trip saving really worth the complexity that the benefits it gives us? And are there simple solutions out there that we can use? And this is why lastly I want to talk about what's ahead for us in the future. And I'm really excited about what the near future holds for resource lazing in the browser specifications. So the first question is, can we just fix the HP2 push problems? There's, they're quite simple. What, how, what can we do to fix that? And that's where the cached digest specification comes in. So what if the browser, whenever it created a new connection, could send a frame called a cache digest that contained a cuckoo filter, which is a, a probabilistic data structure representing all of the items that the browser has for the cache of that hostname? And then the server can be much more intelligent about what it wants to push. It's like, OK, I'm not going to push main.css because I know you have that in your cache, but I am going to send you the, my new version of my JavaScript application because you, you don't have the latest version of that. And I'm also really excited by not just for solving push. This opens up a, a lot of great opportunity for us, for instance, in the JavaScript um, bundling and modules world that we could choose and be more intelligent of what we bundle and what we send down if we have a bit more knowledge about the client cache state. And so going back to the repeat view, if we had cache digests, for our first view, we could push. But then on the subsequent view, the client says, no, I've already got that in my resource. And we wouldn't have to push it. And that makes me really, really happy. Cache digest specification is an experimental in, in ITF at the moment. Um, it was proposed by my colleague Kazuo, and it's been worked on by Yoav Weiss at Akamai. Um, but I think we're going to start seeing implementations land in browsers soon. Farsi have already got the first implementation of the server side of that in our open source HP2 server H2O. But this all seems a bit too complicated. Like We're still having to maintain a lot of logic to, to manage state between the client and the server. HTTP, after all, is a stateless protocol, right? It's one of the, the why it's so beautiful. And so it's a bit too complicated. And this is where the 103 early hint specification comes in. And this, again, is proposed by my colleague Kazuo at Fastly. Who here has heard of 100 informational ranges at all? I hadn't at all until this came out. And so 103 is a new HTTP response code that allows the server to indicate the, the, to the client the resources that are going to be required for the, the next, for the, for the 200 response that's coming. And it looks like this. When we perform a GET request, we um, then send down an initial response just containing headers using our friend uh, link rel preload. And then the, the browser gets to decide, OK, I've got this, I don't have that, and initiate those fetches early during that server think time. And this is what it would look like on the wire. So it's, it's as simple as that. And that's why I think this is a lot more powerful than push, because we're moving that logic and that decision process back to the browser where it belongs. So the server can quickly send down a 103 response saying, here are all the critical resources for this page. You decide what you want to do with it, and then subsequently follow up with a 200. Again, this has been accepted by ITF. It's in experimental mode. We've got a working implementation at Fastly on the server side. But the problem is, at the moment, many browser vendors are worried about the complexity this adds to the networking stack. We're also worried we're going to break the internet because a lot of middle proxies don't understand the 100 range. So it will only be served over TLS to overcome that problem. So early hints gives us all of the same benefits as push, but it's much simpler. And we can leverage the browser cache now and not have the complexities of the H2 server push cache. And just more importantly, I think it's great because it allows the client to do the decision making. 
And finally, um, <coughs> we know that we've got preload to do the headers, um, and a new specification is coming out called Priority Hints that allows us as the application developer to decorate our HTML with res resources of saying, I know this hero image is high priority, but this fetch request is low. And I urge you to go and check out the specification and, and add to the, um, to the GitHub page here. So in closing, I've run out of time, so I've got to wrap up, I'm afraid. We've only just scrapped the surface here of methodologies that but I hope I've given you some techniques that you can use today. HP2 doesn't solve everything, but there are a lot of things coming out to solve this. Resource loading in the browser is hard, but I'm excited by the future. But most importantly, performance is for humans. Optimize for a good user experience, not for the networking stack. Measure your experience and optimize for that. And so the checklist of what if I was going to do today, identify your critical resources, preload any hidden sub-resources, avoid push where possible, and the future is looking great. We can decorate our HTML with priority hints and use early hints when they come available. Thank you very much.